working together to maximize their score. Both teams will receive the same points. Each of these teams consists of two drivers and one robot. One driver will operate the robot for the first half of the match, and the other driver will operate it for the second half. Second, each team will have the opportunity to play driving skills challenge matches. In these matches, teams have 60 seconds of driver-controlled time to score as many points as possible. Third, each team will have the opportunity to play programming skills challenge matches, in which they have 60 seconds of autonomous robot operation to score points. No drivers allowed. XIQ Challenge Squared Away is played on a 4 foot by 8 foot field. Robots and game objects start on the field in predetermined positions. There are scoring zones in the four corners of the field and three platforms along the sides of the field. Be sure to double check the robot and starting position rules this year as they may not be the same as previous Vex IQ Challenge games. The scoring objects in Vex IQ Challenge squared away are three inch diameter balls and seven inch cubes. There are a total of 35 balls and seven cubes on the field. The object of the game is to score as many points as possible with your alliance partner in one of two ways. By scoring balls in or on cubes and by moving cubes to their associated scoring zones. A ball scored inside a cube is worth one point each. A ball scored on top of a cube is worth two points each. Teams will have to experiment with balls and cubes to figure out the best way to score points here. A red or blue cube scored in the same color scoring zone is worth 10 points. And a green cube scored on a platform is worth 20 points. Cubes and balls are scored independently of each other. So, if a robot places three balls on top of a cube, that alliance has just earned six points. Then, if they score that cube in a scoring zone, they've just earned 10 more points. That's a total of 16 points. For official robot requirements and game rules for Vex IQ Challenge Squared Away, please see the Vex... Okay, what you guys notice about that game, what are some things that uh, you like or dislike or what? Yeah. Putting 35 balls in a, you know, in a room full of middle school students like the worst yeah. idea ever. <laughs> 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 These are a lot bigger than I thought they would be when they came in. They're like baseball, so it's like better. Yeah. Um, what else? What else? Like, there's a lot of ways. A lot of ways. A lot of ways are very different than the last year's game. What else did you know? Who said that? Yeah, oh my, that's, that's my biggest frustration, I think, with this game. The OCD in me, as soon as the match starts, those balls don't stay where they're supposed to stay. And so they're just rolling everywhere, and, and, that, and the, the setup is annoying. I don't remind me where the match is. What else? Anything else? No parking. No parking. End game. No, yeah, no like final end game, exciting hanging or balancing or whatever, yeah. There is a whole lot to do in one minute. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're right. A lot of different strategy, a lot of different design options this year as opposed to last year. I think there should be a lot of just you, you can almost divide that board in half and each team's board on their end. So you have to move the boxy out to the side. Yeah, almost, yeah, I think you're right. There's a lot of less collaborative collaboration this year. Um, something that I noticed uh, is the number of scoring elements. So if you remember, how so many of you guys were coaches during the first three years of groups that for you guys? Um, how many scoring elements were there? Aside from the balancing ramp, uh, how many scoring elements? Just one, right? Just the next one. And then ringmaster, aside from the bonus tray, there was what? The range, right? One. Next level, aside from the hanging bar, there was what? The hubs. This year, you've got the balls and you've got the cubes, which is going to completely dictate your design and strategy and whatnot. We're going to talk a lot about that in a little bit. 
But I think they did that on purpose because last year the biggest beef, especially with like, the Chinese teams, is uh, because of the fact that there was only uh, one scoring element and you could only carry one or lift one at a time, mm -hmm. it was more driven towards having good drivers as opposed to really cool designs. And so you didn't have to have an amazing design last year to be really, really good. <coughs> this year, I think it kind of caters to both. Uh, so if you want to focus on a really cool Chinese design and have these conveyor belts that suck up all the orange balls, you can do that. But maybe your strength is in your driving and not necessarily your design. The cubes are pretty easy to manipulate and move around as well. So um, anyway, that's what I've got there. Points overview. I'll talk about that too. Uh, you kind of get that already, but we'll just go really quick. Really quickly, I think the points are kind of strange too. Um, because there's a big gap between the balls and the cubes. Uh, one point for a, a ball inside, two points for a ball on top, and then ten points just for simply moving that red cube to that red scoring zone there. And then 20 points for simply lifting that up and putting it right there. So the first conversation, yeah. You know, I would, one thing about that thing is my concern is if you ever run an event, we're going to have to really train the kids to set that up and less than a minute. Yeah, do you remember Remaster? You guys are going to practice. You, get that, yep. you have to set that up. And I will say, it's like putting this stack right here, I have pretty small hands. Kids have even smaller hands. It's hard to get these to sit right there. And then they, quit. they just kind of, yeah. It's, <coughs> it's not a trick, maybe that'll be on the Facebook page. But it's like some kind of trick. Yeah. It's been worse in the past. Yeah. <laughs> They've done a really good job of making it better. And it does impact the tournaments as far as how many fields you run and things like that, how long it takes to set up. Last year we were able to run more fields and run at faster paces because the setup was easier than the year before. Um, the first conversation that you should be having, or one of the first, I guess, conversations that you should be having with your team is what you need to be going for, right? Like, what do you want to achieve? And, and that's going to then dictate the design of your robot uh, beyond the basic build. Because I think, oh, I, this clutch lot, it's garbage. <laughs> I think it can pick up a ball at a time. Can it even move the cube? It's not Yes, it's not great. Um, so figure out what the, what we always do at the beginning of our season is we figure out what the, the highest point total were, or what they are. So like last year with Next Level, uh, my kids wanted to get the, the, the yellow bonus up off the, the hanging bar. They wanted to be able to stack that. So there's four points. They wanted to be able to do a high hang. All of those things are great, but then you're going to have to then design your robots to be able to do those things. And that's the big problem, right? Um, so the conversation that we're going to have, and I'm not going to just tell them this, but you kind of lead it, is what points do we want to get? Do we want to focus on trying to spend an entire minute picking up three orange balls and putting them inside of the cube? I mean, it seems like a waste, you know what I mean? You're going to get, the match is over, you got three points, congratulations. Or do you want to spend an entire minute trying to get those green cubes, stacking those up, there's 60 points right out of the gate. Uh, that's, that's just a conversation you have to have that's going to drive in the design of your... Can I point out something about the platforms? I, yeah. I, I looked at this early on. You're not going to... Like last year, a lot of us had robots that, you know, up this way. Because of the high restriction on robots, you're going to have to pick that cube up at the bottom or you're not going to make that yeah. all five. So this platform is, is uh, nine and a half inches tall, and this cube is seven inches tall. So the math is nine and a half plus seven, 16 and a half. This year, you cannot, your robot cannot extend higher than 15 inches like it could last year. Remember that? Like last year, you could start at 15, but you could go to 50 feet if you wanted to. Uh, this year, you, have, you are maxed out at 15 inches. Uh, so if you're picking it up like this, you know, from the top, you're going all the way to the top to get it up here. That's 16 and a half inches. You've already exceeded the height limit. So you're going to have, and again, these are the conversations that you should be having with your kids because that's going to drive your design. We're not going to do that passive claw or lift or whatever to just hold it up here. We're going to grab something down here so that's going to go however many inches or whatever. Um, good point. Great. Another question. Um, 
the balls are that's inside. Right. I know, I'm sorry. That's right. Go ahead. Uh, you can fill that, fill the boxes up with, with balls. If the balls that uh, the boxes have a, a grid on the bottom on some of them and on the top. <coughs> yeah. If you fill a ball, let's say you take it, the other one's upside down. They're supposed to be. These two right here. So you mean this? If you do this? Yeah, and if you continue to stack them up on top of that, you get the points for being up high. No. Okay. We're going to talk this about how to get you. Okay. No. That cross section right there has to be the furthest point the away from the floor. Okay. So, at the top. Um, yeah, good question. Yes? Um, I have a question about scoring in the corners with points. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get there. Okay. We'll get there. Oh, wait. That's all right. Any other questions? Do you have a question up here? Um, lecture. Lecture. Do you have a question? No, I'm just waving at <laughs> the only thing I would say when we talk, with Jim was saying this this one is actually taller, but it's actually it's actually narrower and smaller too. So this one's narrower and smaller than that one, so it's a little bit more challenging to balance on here. And then, as you just pointed out, uh, in order to get two points, it has to be on top of the grid like this. Well, these two start upside down. So if you wanted to stack balls on top of it, you're going to have to figure out a way to flip it over if you wanted to put on top and stack on top of here. So, two things I point I noticed, unless you go in the field and see it, you don't really catch that piece of video. Um, you can see the scoring zones, they're colored. There you go. Nice, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the, the main thing here, and this is kind of obvious, the blue cubes are on this side, and the scoring zones are on that side. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that okay. because they're, they're, that's that's going to be the controversy. If you're, if you're on like the Vex IQ Facebook group or whatever, there's all these scenarios that people post and whatnot. We're going to get into the specifics of, of what an actual score score cube is. But he's going to talk about the ball scoring first. I think we just talked about a little bit whether whether that's that's your inside um, that one's inside the cube. It's not not on top. Uh, it has to be halfway, right? Or what not even halfway. It has to be partially within the cube. And not touching something. Yeah. 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 Ye
You need to stack them and just <coughs> one up and it counts as all the top. Stack two cubes and fill in so it's all on top of the one, like that. Yes. Well, I'll put it over here. Yeah, so again, yeah. so it counts. Put two cubes in here and then stack it up. No. This is, this is either one. Even though they're a, a, the other way. Right. They're both. The red two can split the other way. They're both, but they the red one both. They, again, all the balls will only count one time, somewhere. So these are, according to the red one, they're both the red cube. Yeah. There doesn't say anything about the rules about having a contact red cube. The fact that they're not counting the red cube doesn't invalidate it. The fact that they're both the red cube, the red cube is oriented correctly, and the fact that within the green volume, there's six balls that are on top of the red cube. Yes. Now, well, well, you, is that a good strategy? No, because you wasted 20 points right here to get six. <laughs> <laughs> So the cube score, and this is where you're going to get the majority of your points, the 10 points would be 20 points. Um, a cube score in a corner goal, if any part of it is contacting a corner goal, the same color as the, of that cube. Now here's the thing, the rules specifically say, see the definition of corner goal for specific details. The corner goal, if I want to score this red one in here, the corner goal, so I went and looked at the definition, and here's what the definition says. And, and it's a lot, of, a lot of words, but really the black part, the bolded part is most important. It says, corner goal definition, one of the four six inch square goal located in the corners, yada, yada, yada. Um, the field perimeter and the black lines are not considered part of the corner goal. So if you look at the field here, well, which one you? if you look right here, this black corner here is not part of the scoring goal. And this field perimeter is not part of the scoring goal. It has to touch somewhere within the white part. So if it's even touching a millimeter of that white corner there, anywhere in that white corner, touching even a millimeter of it, it's scored. And so you can see, oh, sorry. this one obviously scored because part of it's touching. It doesn't, I guess the biggest question people are like, does it have to get perfectly up? No, it doesn't. It can just touch part of it. Um, that second picture that was up there, that <laughs> scene, uh, if you remember, was just kind of barely touching the inside white. And then that last picture, um, yeah, perfectly. Um, and then that last picture that you can see had um, this one over here. It's not scored. And the reason it's not scored is because this edge right here is touching the black. This edge right here is touching the field perimeter. None of it is touching the white part. Not a single bit of it is touching the white part. So that's not scored. Yeah, if you pull the back some, or yeah, if you push forward some, and, and some of it is touching the white, like this edge right here, if you push forward a millimeter, yeah, it can touch it all. As long as some part of it is touching the competitions are going to be. Well, the rules in general are hard to write. Right? Yeah. Many people are trying to write rules that are incomparable, as minimal as gray edge as possible. And touching a specific area has a very specific hard edge on it. Now, the, the difficulty comes in those really near touches, right? So if a robot has a piece break off of it, it's here, it's holding this up ever so slightly so it's above the thing. Yeah. By the hard reading of the rule, that's not contacting the zone, so it won't score. Even though everybody who sees this would say, that's definitely scored, it's in the zone. No, there's a little piece of plastic from the robot that broke off that makes it not score. Yeah. So those are the tough cases. Yeah. Um, and then the note at the bottom there says a maximum of only one cube can count for points per corner goal. So remember you asked that we can't stack two of the red ones. It's for all goals, you can't stack three if you're not a yeah. yeah. Corner goals and platforms, one cube each. If you have to put two in a corner goal, uh, both right color or two on the platform, then one will count, and the other one does not count. Uh, if you want to get the, the, 20, the 20 pointers by putting them on the platforms, pretty obvious the cube has to be contacting the platform. It can be touching the supporting structures, it cannot be touching the floor or, or the field room. So if you're sitting like that, like, great, that's awesome. You're hanging off the platform, but you're touching this right here, that doesn't count. But if somehow, some way, you're hanging off. That's good. That's actually very common. That, that's common? Yeah. So, <laughs> at, at camps, I saw teams who put it up there like that and then bumped it and it fell over the back and ended up sitting right back. Basically, general rule of thumb for the scoring goal for the corner 
centers and the platforms has to be touching a millimeter of the white part, and it has to only be touching the platform. Can't be touching the floor. They can hang off however it wants. Um, does it say anything in the rules about your robot still touching the cube when it's scored? Like, at the end, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. at the end? They, they didn't do a very good job. But yeah. at the very beginning of all the scoring section, the first line says, to be scored, you can't be touching a robot. So every ball and every cube that's touching a robot is automatically not scored. Straight away. Unfortunately, it said in one little line, then they went through right. six pages of describing it and never touched on it again. So it's very easy to miss it. So the green cube does not have to be on the platform. It just right. has to be touching it. So if it's actually touching it on the side, wedged in, like, say, on another cube, so it's not touching the floor, that would count. Yep. I just, I just have to get this to where it's hanging on the back of the couch. Yeah. This would count as well, sure. Because yeah. it's contacting the platform, not contacting the floor. Oh, yeah. You could technically get it on the floor, maybe, and get it to because we have the other Doesn't matter. Contact is left. So, the way Vex does it, tries to do it in the simple sense possible. The steps for this morning says it's not touching a robot. That was the first slide in the morning. And then it's touching the platform and not touching the floor. That's scored. So, touching a cube, touching balls, touching everything else is fine. Not touching a robot, touching the platform, not touching the floor. You just go through those checklists. Is it touching the robot? No. Is it touching the platform? Yes. Is it touching the floor or another robot? Or another you know, Is it touching the floor or the wall? No. Therefore, it is scored. There you go. I wouldn't intentionally try to do all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are more random cases when you have to walk up the robot. Exactly. It has this should not be a design yeah, challenge. This is, <laughs> <a robot. laughs> this, is more, this is more of the when things fall off at the end of the match. Yeah. Pretty much all these things will happen during the practice at some point. Does that count? Probably. Yeah. All right, Steve. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a website. Again, all these all these slides, all these presentations you can get. George sent you a link to them. Um, so this is where you go to ask questions about uh, all this stuff. You want to know, we see a lot of times people post a picture, does this count? And they'll get a thousand answers on it. Most of them are not. Yeah, right. Yeah. The coach's corner on Facebook, I seriously, seriously encourage you to join that. There's a lot of activity in there. A lot of people, I think, have had a lot of answers, but there are questions and answers because of that group. There's the Facebook group, SexIQ Robots. I think that's where the last one I saw I had was commenting on the expert on scoring. Um, what was that? Do you remember what that one was? It was kind of like, oh, it was hanging off the wall, right? But it was still touching the scoring yeah, area. Yeah, it, it was still touching the scoring area. It was just kind of up on onto the wall. And, and they didn't two balls inside. Yeah. Yeah, it was 12 balls. Right. Yes, sir. Because our Facebook squad. Is there any other forum? There's a Vexite IQ forum. That's the same. That forum is the official. That's as far as the rules, it's the rule book plus that. The top link is the question QA, right? The only people who can answer your answer on the QA is DEC, the Games Like Committee, who's several people. And if you answer a challenge, if you ask a challenging question, do not expect an answer for a month. <laughs> they, they have to figure out the right way to answer it to not cause other problems and game, you know, rules and stuff like that. And it, it's, it's a team of people. It used to be a, the same guy had pretty much autonomy carpet. He would answer immediately. Now they have a team, and so it takes them a month to get any significant challenge. Yeah. Well, if he's looking for non-Facebook groups, I think Randy was trying to start up a Slack channel. Um, so he can wait until Randy gets here. He can sure. ask him about that. Not resources. You can't even get Facebook on your phone. I just Size parameters, we talked about this a little bit already. Uh, last year, I think it was what, 11 by 20. Could never expand beyond 11 by 20. Um, and they changed that this year to 11 by 19. And I think the reason for that, you correct me if I'm wrong, because the starting position for your robots was 11 by 19. And you could still pass inspection with 11 by 20, but when you start the, the match, you're extending an inch beyond the starting position, which you're not allowed to do. 
And so I think they're just like, you know what? And they, they also included the starting position as the field parameter, which is like an inch as well. So they're like, well, you can hang off one inch, and there's your 20 inches. But you're not going to design a robot to do that. So Yeah, the, the, the problem was that the uh, sizing box, which was one by 20, right. you could pass, and you could not be able to start manually because of that little because wall section out. that you lose. <laughs> So they just make it 11 by 19. You cannot ever extend beyond 11 inches wide or 19 inches long. And then this year, the, the new, the big thing, and we already talked about it, we were asked it, especially pertaining to the, the, the big platform there, you cannot at all expand vertically beyond 15 inches. At all. Is that good? Looks good. It's pretty close. It's right. Um, so you're going to have to, that's a huge talking point with your kids as far as strategy and, and designing your robot because <coughs> you can't lift it up the top and stack it. I've already seen videos on YouTube of teams who have apparently not seen this rule and they have, you know, this, yeah, you know, they're just lifting it like 30 inches to get it on there. Well, this, really this is the first time ever that Vex has done a vertical limit. Yeah. So nobody's used to this. On that point, it's really quick. I think clutch is a great starting point for first year teams, but um, clutch is not legal. Yeah. Uh, as built. So right now this is clutch right here. It's legal as long as you don't want to be on the yes. high plate. So this you is drive it, the high. You would just operate. You would have to either uh, never allow your kids to operate it above 15 or it'd be legal, or come up with a physical, mechanical hard stop of sorts that doesn't make you go over 15, or you program it that it never goes above 15. But so this is a great starting point, but you can't drive around at this height. Yeah, I, I, I'd say not a great starting point. This is a, a, a starting point. <laughs> it is a starting point. Maybe not for you on this front. Last year's last year's flex spot was a great starting point. You could be competitive and win tournaments with flex. You can't win tournaments with flex. I, I can't drive this right now that it's not connected, but uh, I mean, you can just see very quickly how top heavy this thing is. It is extremely top heavy. Now, one thing that is pretty cool, I would say, about it is the way that it picks up cute. Oh, sorry. The way it picks up cutes off the back end is with this little hook on the back. So it actually, and you see it in that video, it actually picks up cutes, carries it, and kind of poops it out in the back. <laughs> this is kind of a neat way to pick up balls on one end, pick up cutes on the other. It's a neat kind of strategy, but anyway. Just, awesome. just a little side note, too, a little soapbox thing. You guys need to modify beyond this road. <laughs> It's, it is amazing to me to go to competitions to see how many people like it in February or January and you've got your modified robot and you have 18 other robots there that are still the claw bot or still the flex bot after four months. Please modify, please advance your robot a little bit. Um, and then they always ask me, I've had this question a million times, where did you get the directions for that robot, for your robot? Like, it's, it's the modifying part. Beyond the clutch. Allow your kids to fail. Like, yeah. Let them prototype a bad design and figure out it doesn't pick up balls and let them come up with a creative solution. But Jake's not saying that because like he doesn't want to play. Well, maybe he doesn't want to play with clutch pots. But at the same time, the whole point of this is for kids to make their own robot. So their own design. Let them come up with a crappy robot. That's fine. They should be proud of and their that, robot. That seems obvious, but I don't know if it necessarily is obvious to a lot of coaches. They they just are blown away that there's something other than this. Age restrictions this year. I think this is still in discussion. They they had made it a rule and they kind of flipped it a little bit. I think it may be something they were talking about it again. They're gonna anyway. Uh, this is kind of a big deal. Basically, how many of you are elementary? Is this elementary and middle school? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so how many of you are just elementary coaches? Okay. This will affect you a lot more than middle school coaches. Um, this section right here, elementary school student is any student born after May 1st, 2007. In other words, who will be 12 years old or younger at Bench World's 2020. So if you are, how many of you are in elementary that has like sixth grade in your elementary? That might affect you guys a lot more than it would affect us. We didn't have any kids on my fifth grade, any of my fifth graders last year that were 12 at Worlds. Is that right? 13. Yeah, we, did. we had the girl who turned 12 like three days after. But 
Uh, if, as long as you were 12, it, originally it was 11. That's what the first thing was. You'd be 11 by worlds. Uh, and that knocked out a ton of kids. Because what happens is, you have even one kid who falls into that, your entire team becomes a middle school team. You need to be in the middle school. That happened to you. Yeah. You could have a kindergartner, 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 and a 13 year old, and now you're a 7 year old. Um, which, is, which is crazy. Now that they, they've changed it to be 12, so you could be 12 years and 364 days by the world, and you're good to go. And I think that should be okay, even for a lot of sixth grade elementary teams. But you will definitely want to figure that out as this is like in the beginning of the season. Yeah. What do you think of a middle school and as a fifth grade? That's okay. Yeah, you're fine. The middle school teams that have kindergarten, but they, they couldn't go down and play. No. The they, it's always about the oldest student on the team. Yeah. But that's the whole team. If the whole team is young enough, you can form a fifth grade team. It's ES. Oh, sure. We do yeah. that. Yeah, so absolutely. If, you, if you're a middle school and you have fifth graders, then they could be an elementary yeah. team. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Middle school is almost universally fifth to eighth or fifth to sixth sometimes. Right. In Vex, the world of middle school is six, seven, eight. Fifth grader kind of elementary in, in the Vex. You say in the past it would have been no. No, it would have if, if your school included an eighth grader. That's, no, that's correct. Now, in the past, if you had fifth graders in a middle school, they would meet the elementary requirements so you could play elementary. But they were in a school. It doesn't matter. It's all about the age of the kids. There was a special exception. Well, that's in previous years. In previous years, you would have a sixth grader who play in elementary. You know, that's maybe worse. When we're talking about this registering the kids, you can have a bunch of young kids that are elementary age register a middle as a middle school team, and they can then compete in middle school, but then they can't compete in the elementary. And likewise, any elementary team that is registered as an elementary team cannot compete in any middle school. So, I mean, you have to, you have to register them. Some events are blended, where they can allow them. You can have blended events, but they can't register. The elementary team cannot register for middle school. I think they're still going to revisit this at some point, so we'll be looking out for the final final say. I don't know what the final final say is going to be, but there's a question there. Right there, yeah. I'm a student who will be 7th grade this year, but will be turning 14 in March. So that, by this, would not be able to play on the team in eighth grade. No. Yeah, it's elementary. Elementary college. Middle school is anybody. But it said a student is defined as anyone born after May 1st, so who will be 14 or younger. So that's why I was asking. Yeah, that's what she's asking. She's got a 15 year old. Yeah, I might be 14 and 7th grade. Now, I would argue, because there's the next sentence, if there's a reason why that student is older and in a lower grade, that's what that next line is saying is eligibility will be graded based on the eligibility. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, you can use that to your advantage because I really don't think that as long as you're being fair about it, I really don't think we're going to be, I don't want to put the I'm going to take my name out of it, I'm not part of this. I don't think REC is going to be asking for a medical record of why the student is being held back. Yeah, but you can, you can bet that other teams will yeah. argue that for sure. But if you go back to my previous, none of us in this room will. <laughs> We don't want to create any robot drum. Okay? So, you can let Randy know, you can let the event partner know, and they will deal with it, but we won't say anything to those students or those coaches. We keep those thoughts to ourselves. Yes, to keep in mind, the better that team is, and you know, if they're like competing number one, number two in the world sort of thing, there's going to be more scrutiny on them. If they're not, you know, very competitive, there's not going to be much Yes. So are you saying if your team sucks, don't worry about it? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that. 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 Don
We just need to be fair. I mean, I, I think we need to be fair. I think that REC is going to do their best to try. I don't think they're going to police the visit. It's not like Little League, we're going to be asking for birth certificates when you check in. I would just tell you, there are photos that we have of the state championship where there are fourth graders that are as tall as a high school student, and people were being disrespectful to that team. And I'm going, I know this student, and he's an elementary student, and you guys are being jerks right now as you're saying that they're that like a high school student. I can't believe they're on that team. Like, keep your comments to yourself if you don't know everyone's situation. So, REC will regulate this. If you guys have specific questions about your specific team, you can ask Randy Decker and he'll help you and help answer those. We, I don't think we should be in the business of policing every single student we see at a competition. One of the best things you can do, if you have a question about somebody's age, is go to the event partner and then drop it. Let the event partner figure it out. Um, as an event partner, we do our best to, to solve, you know, figure out, is that kid legal? He's legal, it's good. And just let it go. The event partner's get a, a, a sheet, a waiver for every student who shows up and it has their birthday, it has their phone, parents' phone number. So if we can dig into that, that's a big thing. I just was ready? curious if I was registered as an elementary team and now because of that age, should, would I have to re register as a, as a middle school and then if that's the case, do I have to change it? So, to answer your question, I would email Randy with that concern. Okay. Absolutely not. Go Randy, can, Randy can switch from elementary to middle school yeah. one level. Okay. Yeah. I just don't you're going to get me You're not. Now, I would throw out if you have an elementary right now, and because of this, you're like, I might be at a middle school. Right. And your school doesn't have one, you can apply for one of our grants. You can do both. And they can practice yeah. together. You can okay. throw that out there. But I'm not. Not saying that that's just an option. Any of you want to add a middle school, we have the money for it. The other thing is, with you, there's that one um, sentence in there that says something about basically paying an IEP for the 14. Does that also work for the 12 year old yeah. in the elementary? Yes. Okay. yes. okay, so, the, so, yes. There's, so there's a, a reason. Watch. We're not making IEPs for kids just to break the rules. <laughs> <laughs> but that is what that is there for. Yes. Okay. Any other questions about eight before we move on? <laughs> okay, so we have six, seven, eight grade. This year my last year my first year. So I just had the sixth grade that came up from the elementary middle school. Are you saying that even though I'm in a middle school, I could get another grant just for my sixth graders and say you guys are elementary and then the seventh and eighth grade in middle school get it? So if your sixth graders would legally be in within that elementary <laughs> age group, yeah. Even though the school's filed. Now it's no longer school, it's just great. Now what I'm nervous of, and I hate, is the fact that they go in and change this and just throw a wrench in all of it. But as it states right now, you're just worried about age. The question is, can he get another grant from you? Yes. If it's, an elementary team. If it's legal within, yes. If, it, if your sixth graders are legally within that 12 Six or Sixth graders have to be 11 and a... You got it. That's it. Yeah. So if you can make an elementary team, he'll give you some more money. <laughs> I mean, it sounds great. I love getting behind the so yes. <laughs> love to help you start another team. Yeah. It's not actual money, it's just for a while. I understand. Yeah. So, on to the robot design. Uh, some of the things you're going to look at when you're, when the kids are designing robots is how to score points. And I always tend to sit down with the kids and say, okay, well, what can we do to score points? One of the first things I will talk about is can we build a robot without an arm that's just going to push stuff around the field? And how many points can we score to do that? A lot of times when you're when you have the, the younger kids, you know they're a lot of times they're challenged just to drive a robot around the field. If they have to move the arm, line it up, grab something, it can be it can be difficult. Um, if you can score points on the field without actually grabbing anything and lifting it up, you may do okay. I had a team a couple years ago just made a, a, a it was for the, the crossover challenge. They had a robot that didn't have an arm. It, they just drove it around. It won the first two events they went to in teamwork because they drove really well. Uh, we talked about the build season. They used that for driving practice. They had a really simple robot that they were really good at driving around the field. And so one of the things you can do here is look and see, well, how many points can we score just by pushing things around the field? Without lifting anything off the field, um, 
if we just focus on the orange balls, how many points can we score? And, and you kind of look at this and say, well, sure, if we can grab this cube up here and get up there, we'll get 20 points, and that's hard to match with the orange balls. But then again, that takes some kids that can drive. And we don't always have, on our, our second, third, and fourth teams, we don't have the best drivers. So we want to figure out how we can make them as successful as possible, which gauges being a simple robot pushing stuff around the field. So how many balls have we got? 35 balls. If we can get all those in the, into a cube somewhere, that's 35 points. Uh, it's going to be tough to do in a minute. But again, if you're going to grab the, if you can push the blue, blue cubes down on this end of the field, that end of the field, push them around, you can get your 40 points just for getting those four cubes into the corners, right? Without lifting anything off the field. You can pack them with balls because you're just going to be pushing the balls in there. That's or 16 more points right there, right? Just put four balls in each cube. Um, this is the kind of stuff that you really want to look at in your when you're talking to kids about the design. Not just what do they want the robot to do, but you kind of have to look and see, well, what can these kids do? Can they build a robot that has an arm that can grab and not go over 15 inches and actually do a good job of grabbing the cubes? Um, that's why we've got a couple questions here to look at um, how we can kind of break down the game. One of the big things that I actually do during the season is I'll, I'll kind of break the season into three pieces. And we look from the start of the season through December and say this is our, our opening season. We don't have to score a lot of points to do well in these tournaments for, for the first couple months. If you have a robot that you can drive well and, and get around the field, uh, you may be able to win your tournament. You may be able to get your state bid early in the season, then you don't have to really worry about it. Um, another thing that I've seen is the kids that designed a big fancy robot, which can't do anything in November or December. Okay, so they're just kind of showing up and all they can do is drive the robot and they're not going to score a whole lot of points. But they're hoping in January that, that the robot's going to be working. And so that's the second part. We have January through basically through the state tournament where you want a robot that's able to do a lot of stuff. And then, if you're lucky enough, from the state tournament to the Worlds, you have another season where if you're going to win at Worlds, your robot has to be perfect. Everything has to be perfect. Um, my goal is always to get to the state tournament have fun at Worlds. Uh, because you're not going to get, you don't always get the lucky draw you need at Worlds. So, um, so I, I generally look at this and, and Try to say, we're going to focus on one thing. Maybe we'll focus on pushing stuff around the field. Maybe we're just going to focus on the cubes. If we can if we can get a robot that all it's going to do for the first part of the season is put up three green cubes, if we can do that in every single match, that may be enough for us to win. You know, 60 points in every match. Our team, our, our alliance may have helped us, may have pushed some of the other cubes around. Maybe not. But one of the big things that you'll see through December, is if you can be consistent, doesn't have to be an awesome score, but if you can consistently score, you're going to do pretty well. You're going to be among the top scores. So just kind of breaking it down a little bit, if you decide, if kids decide that they want to focus on the orange balls, what is the max number of points that you can get if you're not even worrying about the cubes at all? This is a question. Now, what's the max number of points you can get if you're just focusing on the orange balls? 35 if they're on the inside, but double in 70 if they're on top. That's what we're focusing on. So there's 70 points if you're just focusing on the on the orange balls, and that's going to be really difficult to achieve in one minute, especially considering two of the cubes are upside down purposely. You're going to have to flip those over and put them on top. So 70 points max if you're focusing on the orange balls. Um, what is the max number of points if you, if you focus solely on the cubes? 100, yeah. 10, 20, 30, 40, 60, 80, 100, get them up on the left. 100 points just for moving the cubes around. Um, that seems a lot more reasonable to do in one minute than trying to collect all 35 balls and stack them on top of the cubes. So these are the kind of conversations that you should be having with your kids, that they should be having, uh, because that's going to drive your design. These are good questions to ask the kids. Even if, 
Even if you want to say, yes, if we're not lifting any of the orange balls, how many points can we score with balls? That gives them the chance to think of, well, how can I, how can I score those points? What can I do? Because um, I can't really lift the ball, put it into the queue. And so they're going to realize that, oh yeah, if you push the cube against the side, then I can just push the ball and it goes right in. Now we're going to get them thinking about different strategies on different ways of doing it. No, that's not going to be a winning strategy, but that's going to help them get to the point where, oh yeah, well, we can make a robot that does that, or does this. Cool thing is there's no limit to how many cubes you can carry. So you can somehow make this contraption that you can carry four cubes which you have to put them on um, The other thing I was going to say too is your design, your strategy is going to change progressively throughout the season. So um, you know, maybe the early part of the season you're focusing on the orange balls because that maybe seems, or, or sorry, the, the cubes because it maybe seems a little bit easier to manipulate the cubes. And then you uh, maybe you do well at state, you make it to worlds. You want to be able to be a, a complement robot to a lot of the that worlds that you're paired with. Um, so maybe you add a contraption on your on your robot that can also vacuum up the balls as well as manipulate the cubes. Um, and just change your strategy based on, we're going to get into that a little bit later during the competitiveness, I think, but um, basically determining your, your strategy based on who your alliance is. Again, one of the ways that I would probably break this down, first third of the season, try to focus on getting the cubes, managing the cubes. Now, by the time you get through December, January, everybody's realized that's a good strategy. Yeah. So I can let Jake's team worry about the cubes, and I'm going to figure out how I can score the balls to help Jake's team score. And then when we go to Worlds, I have to be able to do both. Yeah. So like at Worlds last year, you know, there were a lot of teams that had the Stingers or the Praying Mantis or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they always started on the right side, they turned to the right, they stabbed those four and drug them over, right? Did you guys see anything about that? We knew that that was going to happen at Worlds, and so and our kids were able to do that as well. But we also wanted to score as many points as we could, so we practiced the strategy of, of allowing them to do that, even though we were good at it, but focusing on the cubes that were over, the, the hubs that were over here, and the hubs that were over there, so you can get the maximum number of, of points. And then you're paired with a team that can't do that. That's when you flip to the right, use your stingers, and stab them and move, and so that you're consistently getting a lot of points. Right? Alright, we're gonna, I think our time is almost up with this, and then we're gonna jump into like building things, right? But just really quickly, um, knowing the rules now and knowing the different components and pieces and what the ball score and the cube score, I guess this might, maybe this will be awkward for you as an educator, it shouldn't be if you're an educator. Turn and talk to the people around you. Just talk about what strategies you think would be. Uh, helpful when we get to the beginning of the season, these early competitions in November, December. What are some strategies that you guys have? And we'll shout out
Alright, right here. Um, I'm going to say the right robot, I'm going to call it red robot, left robot, blue robot. So I think a good strategy would be that they go for the green cube straight out, forward, stack them, then whichever team takes a robot uh, to get the middle green cube. And so we're going to say the red robot's getting the middle green cube. Blue robot goes uh, you can, uh, down by the green. They're going to get the first bottom left cube, go up to the top left, uh, top left cube. And then the <coughs> robot will go get the top right, down, bottom right, and then they go crisscross. Yep, crisscross. 100 points. Yep. And then no blue scores. And then after the key girl scores, then they focus on the ball. Ball yes. should, in my opinion, ball should be last because they're cute. One point. Always, always go for green. I think the balls are going to be not more than all to be in the state ball. Yeah. Anything else? Any others? I'll see you next time. Hey, the only thing, is maybe I might be repeating myself. I'm sorry if I am, because I've stepped out for a call this evening on line number four right now. <laughs> when you get paired with a team that does have clutch spots, Please, guys, and then let's try to spread this around in all competitions. We do not want to tell the other team, stay out of my way. I think, and again, I hate the Patriots, but <laughs> this Belichick is very good, and why I think he continues to win, is he's very good at strategy and building a system where everyone on the team contributes. And that's why this is an alliance partner. This is an alliance. A good strategy is trying to come up with a way that that team that's just as a clutch bot or a push bot can contribute to your score. So please, let's try to make sure every team that we're with, we feel like they're they feel like they're a part of the alliance and they don't leave going, I didn't like being paired up with that team because they just told me to stay out of the way and they're a bunch of jerks. So let's try to come up with strategies where everyone can contribute somehow, even if it's just pushing a, a cube in a corner, you can get a lot of points for doing that. There's a couple sides to that. Because when you go into one, of the, into one of these matches where you have a really good robot and one that's not as good, um, they have opposing things. One of the teams is going to be selfish. Either uh, I'm going to be selfish because I want to score points with my, my robot, which barely moves, or they're going to be selfish and try to score as many points as possible, which means mostly getting this robot out of the way. So. Somebody's going to be selfish. And it may be the team scoring a lot of points because that's kind of the point of the tournament. It may be the team that's going to their first event and wants to have some fun driving their robot. And so as coaches, we have to, again, kind of balance that to say, well, what are we here for? Are we here so that his horrible team can drive or so that I can win? Well, then, yeah, so we went to three competitions last year, and then there was one late February that um, we needed two more teams in order for it to be a state qualifying. We had already qualified for state, but we were asked to come just to kind of fill that spot. So it wasn't our intention to win that, I mean, they ended up doing that. But our goal at that tournament, we talked to Steve about this too, have the other team, have the alliances dictate the strategy. And then you guys, since you've already qualified, and you're already pretty good drivers, and you great designs, you do everything else, you're still, and that's good practice for your team, for state, for worlds, but let them dictate the strategy, um, and then you just kind of fill in and get points as you can. Yeah. Um, our alliance, for our students, every time they meet during your alliance, the first thing they always ask them is, what can your robot yep. do? That's what, what is your robot good at? About. And then they always build the strategy over and the, the real challenge with that is, what my robot can do, I did one time in practice. Right. <laughs> Yeah, what can your you robot be consistent? They can lift this cube and put it up there. I did that one day. <laughs> okay, that's great. And so we kind of have to, again, balance, you know, how can our alliance be successful? Yeah. I disagree a little bit. I usually have my kids, the first thing they say is, you need to stay out of our way, and we need to stay out of your way. Because robot entanglement is like the kiss of death. Yeah. So rather than talking game objects, I usually have my kids like, you go over here, 
while we're over here, rather than scoring points, it's like, where are we going to be on the field at any given time so that we're not in each other's way? No, but, that's that's, but that's a yeah, positive thing. What I mean by stay out of my way is some people do literally nothing. say, go in the corner, park, and we can't move. move. Exactly. That, Never I would work. To argue with anyone is a bad strategy and disrespectful to what we're trying to do. Well, it can also say what any robot can do. Yes. Yes. What is my, one of the key, we have two people out there on the field, okay? And I, like last year, the, the driver's sitting there and they're trending and they didn't make it to hang, okay? He didn't get to the hang in time. I'm like, whose fault is it? The kid with the joystick's like, I'm sorry. I'm like, that is not your fault. It was your partner's job. He's the coach. He should have told you when you need to be getting back. So with the one that doesn't have the joystick in their hand, they should be the one coordinating with the other team. Oh, try to pick up from this angle because we're going to be coming over here. They should be coordinating with each other, with the other teams to stay out of each other's way so they don't, you know, block each other and things like that. To that point, you know, we, you know, we have found that having your other, having the partner once they off the controller, calling out time like every five or ten seconds, yeah. letting them know that second, that second yeah. driver once they're in the zone, they're not looking at the clock. It's, it's the driver's job to pick up that object and score it. It's the coach's job, as in the other, the non-driver right. student, to be telling them what to be picking up and what to score. In high school, it's very. We have, you know, we have the driver, we have the coach, and we have the strategist. It's a whole other level of, of thing. But that's very key. That other person that is not driving has a very big, important role. And keep that in mind. And they, you know, they, they want to pass over the controller, and then they're like, I'm yeah. done, you know, or whatever yeah. else sort of thing. You should be coaching them to yeah. count yeah. down the time. So yeah. that, and this that's driver's driving. This person should be going four, three, yeah. two. Right. And that's so, actually something you have to tell that, that first driver when they're coaching is yeah. be calm and give them perfect. instructions. Don't panic and be yelling at the one. Oh my God! <laughs> There's a later on, I think we talked about some competitiveness. Steve a couple of years ago sent me this, this cool idea of phase 10. We're going to talk about this. Um, if you guys ever played the game phase 10, like our game, the rest of the league is still We implement, implemented that into our robotics program for real life scenarios like that to train the kids. You know, like one of the scenarios we'll talk about is I have all of my kids, all my non drivers shouting out like a basketball game, five, four, three, two, when there's actually like 10 seconds left. You know how like students actually And it's, it's designed so that the drivers, uh, the driver is not paying attention to the crowd and the non driver is focused on the time, letting him know, no, there's actually 10 seconds left, 10, 9, 8. And we'll talk about the phase 10 thing. 